the church say amen. amen. If you know God been good to you, you shouldn't mind saying amen. amen. It's good to see uh, Sheila, I gotta say. Um, surely, uh, we miss you, and it's, it's good to see you back. Uh, we see a lot of our folks who maybe left or delinquent on um, places like Facebook and stuff like that, but there's nothing like seeing them face to face. Joy, can you hear me? Lonnie can't hear me either. How about that? All right. Lonnie, you got your hearing aid in? <laughs> but this is the season. This is the season. This is the season where the name of Jesus Christ is highly proclaimed everywhere worldwide. Well, folks, it's, it's, it's calling Christmas. And Jesus' name has been celebrated. And we're thankful for that. This is the season for giving, the season for sharing, the season for, for loving. It's the season to be with family. That's why a lot of our members are, are not with us right now, because they are with family. This is the season for shopping, heavy traffic. So that creates road rage. This is the season. This is the season for bowl games. This is the season where the NFL plays on Saturday. That way we know the playoffs are right around the corner. We seem to be always in the season for mass shootings. December 20th, North Carolina, mass shooting. December 19th, New York, that's a mass shooting. And December 18th, San Antonio, mass shooting. Right in our back, back, backyard, Waynesboro, Mississippi, mass shooting. Last night, California, mass shooting, 12 dead, 3 injured. The Bible says Jesus Christ is the same now, today, and forever. He's always in the season. He's our unchanging Savior. So in our lives, we should always reflect the likeness of Jesus Christ, whatever season it is. It's always the season for giving God the praise he deserves. Any time we can open our eyes and whatever the season is on earth, we should suit up with the whole armor of God. Because it's the season. Not being ashamed to witness and announce to the world that I am a Christian. That's what season it is. God has truly been good to us to allow us to be here to wake up on this time side of our life to see family members and friends. There's a lot of folks last Christmas have gone on but God has so fit to allow us to be here and we should be eternally grateful for that. We get to enjoy family. We get to come uh, with another opportunity to worship God in spirit and in truth. We get the opportunity to show God that we are worthy of his blessings, that we are worthy of that place called heaven. And we should be eternally grateful for that. If you're visiting one of this morning, we want you to know that here at the Church of Christ, the Bible is our God. And Jesus Christ is the author and finisher of our salvation. 
If you have any questions about anything that we say or do while you are here at the Church of Christ, feel free to ask me or any other member, and we'll be sure to give you a Bible question, a Bible answer. But if we don't have the answer for you then, we know where all the answers are, and that is in the written Word of God. The scripture we read this morning comes from the book of Ephesians, chapter 3, verses 8 through 12. And I won't just want to read it again. I'll probably read it again so we can get a clear understanding of what Paul is saying here. Paul said, though I am the least deserving of all of God's people, he graciously gave me the privilege of telling the Gentiles about the endless treasures available to them in Christ. I was chosen to explain to everyone the mysterious plan that God, the creator of all things, have kept secret from the beginning. God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom in its rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authorities in heaven, in the heavenly places. This was his plan. When he carried it out through Christ Jesus our Lord. And because of Christ and our faith in him. We can now come boldly and confidently into God's presence. Of course this is New Testament teaching. From Apostle Paul to the church of Ephesus. In the book along uh, with others it, it, it tells a basic concept of Christian Faith, uh, penned by Paul, of course, inspired by God. And this is one of those times when God pulls back the curtains of history and allow us, his people, to get a clear picture of who we are, what we come from, and, and where we headed. This is the whole substance of Paul's letter to the Ephesians. It was a vision. It was God's vision. And Paul said God had a mysterious plan. And when you look at the whole letter, the whole uh, book of Ephesians, uh, Paul starts out with a message from God in the past. Paul says God had a plan all along. Then Paul says to them and Paul says to us that plan, we are God's plan. And it's our responsibility to make sure this plan, this mission, and accountability does not fall or does not fail with us or our kids, our kids' kids. And me personally, I can see why that was concerned by Paul. Because it seemed like there's no energy to teach our children book, chapter, and verse. Because we see him as little Timmy or a little, little, little James or little Jake. But God sees him as Deacon Timmy or Elder Jake. There's a concern because our children in their relationship with God, it seems like to us that it's not important. We have become familiar with Apostle Paul and his writings and all of his missionaries. If you turn to the back of your Bible, you will see how it's mapped out, how many times and where he went on his first, second, and third journey. On his second trip of Ephesus, the people urged Paul to stay, but he left. But he left Aquila and Priscilla there to continue on their movement, helping the folks carry out their Christian responsibilities. This husband and wife team was left there according to Acts 18, 18 and 21. Paul's ministry lasted three years according to Acts 20 and 31. But as you, the story of Paul's life continues and the plot thickens, Paul was arrested, put in jail for two years in Caesarea. He went to Rome. He was put in jail two more years in Rome. And while he was in jail is where we get these letters from Apostle Paul. I believe there was eight different letters from Apostle Paul in the New Testament. 
It was also said Paul motives for writing these Ephesians was to speak about the challenge the Christian face, which was a constant confrontation with other religion and philosophies of his day. Paul was totally convinced that the religion that he could proclaim was the only one towards redemption. Paul proclaimed his religion, this religion, makes a sonship to God. And so do I. Surely there were some folks asking, well, who is this man, Apostle Paul? Isn't he the Saul of Tosserus? The same man who persecuted the church? Uh, God's children? Isn't this the same man who uh, persecuted the church? Now he preached Jesus? So Paul had to reintroduce himself. Paul said, I am apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God, not by human will, even not by my own will. And knowing Apostle Paul like we know Apostle Paul, we realize the force behind his life or the passion that he had for the unsaved in the church was his only desire that he had. Paul basically wanted anyone to know he was just a man that was spared by God, but he was determined to do the will of God by all means necessary. In all of his letters, his objective was for the reader to know Jesus better, to live out of grace and the good works that God had planned for his people. Paul wanted you to understand that the cross, that cross, Brought us peace. The cross brought the unity of all races and provided access to the Holy Spirit. In the Ephesian letter, you'll see how Paul wanted all who belong to Jesus Christ understand that they were also joined together by uh, Jesus Christ's body, the church, in his church. This church that's built on a foundation of truth. And all who are members of this, this one body are serving in residence of the one Lord. The one faith. The one baptism. The one God. And father of you all that's in you all. Somewhere along chapter 3 and verse 19, Paul talks about the good news in this mysterious plan, a mysterious plan that God calls us to share with others. And through his grace, this mystery, the plan allows us to approach God with confidence and freedom. And Paul turned to prayer in Ephesians 14 and 19. He prayed that Jesus would dwell in all believers, rooted in love, and that we will comprehend and appreciate the goodness of God's love. Paul said, sure, there's one body, but it's made up of individuals, with individuals' gifts. And when members Use their gift the way God approves. It creates a developed church. A powerful church. A growing church. In God's love. Let me say that again. I I didn't get enough amens on that one. Paul said sure there's one body. Made up of individuals. With individual gifts. And when each member use their gift, the way God approves, it creates a developed church, a powerful church, a growing church in God's love. When each member of the church is doing the work that they have been assigned and not trying to do the work that's assigned to somebody else, it creates a seasoned church. And this is where I draw my subject for this morning lesson. I know you've been waiting for it. Well, here it is. God's purpose for the church. God's purpose uh, for the church. 
And it comes from Ephesians 3, which we have already read. Ephesians 3, 8 through 12. If you look into the matter, you also find that there are over 4,200 different religions. It makes you wonder, well, which one is which? Because James said in 127, pure and undefiled religion is this. Christianity is a religion of the church. One would then ask, what church? Here's the answer. The one the New Testament reveals. The membership. The work. The how to worship. When to worship. The purpose. The builder. That one. That's the church. But the truth is, these 4,200 religions or so has blinded many the objective of the first century church. If the objective and the purpose of the church is so clearly seen, then why are there so many misunderstandings about the church? The church has a purpose. Certainly you don't believe we just gather up here for nothing. Just to have something to do. You should be asking yourself, why am I here? Do you think it's the will of God that we don't use our resources reaching out to this community? Do you think it's the will of God that the church has no growth? No ma'am. And no sir. The church has an eternal purpose. In Ephesians 3 uh, verses 10 and 11 this is what the Bible say God's purpose in all this was to use the church to display his wisdom and his rich variety to all the unseen rulers and authority in heavenly places this was his plan which he carried out through Christ Jesus our Lord and just as God has a purpose for the church, he perfected his purpose through and by the Holy Spirit. Look at Ephesians 4, verses 11 through 13. The Bible says, now these are the gifts Christ gave to the church. The apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, and the pastors and teachers. Their responsibility is to equip God's people to do his work. And build up the church, the body of Christ. This will continue until we all come to such unity in our faith and knowledge of God's Son that will be mature in the Lord, measuring up the full and complete standard of Christ. But watch this though. <clears throat> Verse 14. Then. We will no longer be immature children. We won't be tossed and blown away by every wind of new teaching. We will not be influenced when people try to trick us with lies so clever that they sound like the truth. Now this is when those 4,200 religions come into play. Because it's distraction to the church. God is the most wisest person I know. In Romans 16 27, the Bible says, The all wise God. Psalm 147, the Bible says, His power is absolute, His, his understanding is beyond comprehension. In life, we have folks that we consider our go-to person. People we can go to uh, that we trust. People we can find in. Somebody that you, you can call and they will answer. Somebody who's always going to tell you what's right. According to the scripture. I have several go-to. One of my go-to is Yale Canfield, believe it or not. But my other go-to is Brother Bess, Clarence Bess. Brother Bess is my, God, my father in the gospel. 
And there was a time when I was out there doing my thing. But Brother Best didn't give up on me. When I left the church, Brother Best kept calling me, telling me we are here. Bible class is still the same night. He kept encouraging me to come back. And my go-to, when I go to Brother Best, 75% of the time, Brother Best tell me how I am wrong. He tells me the truth. And he always tells me what the Bible says. Psalms 18.4, the Bible says, Wise words are like deep water. Wisdom flows from the wise like a, a bubbling brook. I see Brother Best as a well of wisdom. A well of wisdom that I have to draw from sometimes. And get an understanding. But I dare not to compare Brother Best's wisdom to the wisdom of the almighty God. But when you go back to the teaching of Apostle Paul from Ephesians 3.10, Paul mentioned that the church is the revelation of God's wisdom. His wisdom is seen all over the world, especially in the scriptures, all the way back to the days of Noah. Noah pretty much said you had to get in the boat to be saved. The prophecy of a perfect, sinless, a faultless, a savior from the tribe of Judah, from the lineage of David, a chosen redeemer, the perfect sacrificial lamb to remove the stain of sin that separates God's people. And please believe, if he had any sin, regardless of how humble he was, Regardless of how many people he healed, regardless of how many miracles he performed, if he had sinned, that will be the focal point. But he had no sin. And still there are some trying to portray him as a tainted savior. But in God's wisdom... He's the only way to reconciliation between God and humanity. That's the gospel of Jesus Christ. According to Romans 1.16, the Bible says there's power in the gospel. Ephesians 1.19, Paul says, I hope we understand just how powerful this gospel is. It's the same power that raised Jesus from the dead. And this power, a process of the gospel, persuades us to die to self. It makes us obedient to the truth. And this process raises up, us, us up a new person, Holy Spirit uh, filled. And I stopped by here this morning to tell you that this power and process of God, it still works. The only way a limited, educated man like myself can stand before you and talk to you about God's message from God's pulpit to God's people is from that process. It's the only way. The power in God and the process, it makes us realize and appreciate the grace of God. When you understand the grace of God, you begin to thank God for your issues, your problems, your situation. Because understanding the grace of God, you know for sure that there's somebody out there who got some issues way worse than yours. Listen to me, saints. Hear me good. Those homeless folks out there. Those people who don't have a heated home to go into when it's cold outside. That's us. Separate and apart from the grace of God. That family who house burnt down. And the blaze burnt up everything. And the family was barely able to escape the fire. That's our house. Separate. And apart from the grace of God, that church over there across town, that church building that had to close their doors, 
the bank foreclosed on the building because the members were not able to meet the budget. That's Skyway Hills Church of Christ without the grace of God. There was a young lady here in March 31st. She told us about her cousin who had a lung disease. Her situation got worse. She couldn't get the operation. So she died before she had the transplant. That's me. Separate and apart from the grace of God. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 3 to 7. The Bible reads, all praise to God. The Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has been blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly realm because we are united with Christ. Even before he made the world, God loved us and chose us in Christ to be holy and without fault in his eyes. God decided in advance to adopt us into his own family by bringing us to himself through Jesus Christ. This is what he wanted to do. And it gave him great pleasure. So we praise God for his glorious grace. He has poured out on us who belongs to his dear son. He is so rich in kindness and grace that he purchased our freedom with the blood of his son and forgave our sins. Ephesians 2, 4 through 9. But God is so rich in mercy, he loved us so. That even when we were dead because of our sins, he gave us life when he raised Christ from the dead. It is only by God's grace that you've been saved. For he raised us from the dead along with Christ and seated us with him in heavenly realm because we are united with Christ. So God can point to us and all the future ages as examples of the incredible worth of his grace and kindness towards us as shown in all he has done for us who are united with Jesus Christ. God saved you by his grace when you believe. And you can't take credit for it. It's a gift from God. Salvation is not a reward for good things we have done. So none of us can boast about it. I'm not making this stuff up. This is straight from the Bible. The Bible says in Ephesians 5 that Jesus Christ is coming back for the church. A glorious church. Not a perfect church. But an esteemed church. A well known church. An elevated church. A heavenly bound church. But another purpose for that church. Is to expose and uncover. And advertise. God's glory. This includes the church. God made me. God made you. God made your parents and grandparents. All for his glory. Without the glory of God, there wouldn't be anything in this entire universe. Only two of God's creations have failed to bring glory to him. We know one to be Satan, and the other one is the fallen angels. Because of their pride, rebellion, and sin, it caused them to fail. And it will cause us to do the same thing. And sometimes we do. Because according to the Bible in Romans 3.23, we all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. The question to each member is, will you give God the fullness of your life that he deserves? Somebody may be asking me, well, Brother Bell, what will bring glory to God? Well, let's look in the Bible. 
no further than our example, Jesus Christ. In John 17, 4, the Bible says, I brought glory to you here on earth by completing the work that you gave me to do. How do we bring glory to God? Here's the answer. When you do everything or anything that God created you to do. That's what brings glory to God. The birds in the sky flying and chirping and, and nesting and doing bird-like activities that God intended for them to do. And that brings glory to God. When an ant do things that ants supposed to do, it brings glory to God. And we bring glory to God by worshiping him. That's our first responsibility, to worship God. A worship motivated by truth. Love, thanksgiving, not just because you, you have to be here. Somebody made you come. So I ask you again, why are you here? God is most glorified in us when we are most satisfied in him. Worshiping God is more than just praying and singing songs or, or praying to God. When you use your life for God's glory, everything you do becomes an act of worship. The Bible says, use your whole body as a tool to do what's right for the glory of God. Look at Romans 6.13. That's what the Bible says. Romans 6.13. It's down now. You can read it. talk about loving one another all the time. First Corinthians, we say that's the love chapter. Loving your neighbor is it's a command. The point I think we miss sometimes is that when you become a member in God's family, it's just not a matter of believing that. Not just belonging, but it's a matter of practicing loving your neighbor, loving your brothers, John said that our love for one another, it proves that we have gone from life to death. In 1 John 3.14, anyone who does not love, John says, you remain dead. That's what the scriptures say. Paul said, accept each other as Jesus accepted you. Then God will be glorified. Romans 15, 7. Spiritual growth brings glory to God. The growth mission is to develop a Christ-like character. God gives a new life, a new nature for the rest of our days. And he wants us to continue the process, continue to grow, continue to change your character. Philippians 1, 11. This is what the Bible reads in Philippians 1, 11. May you always be filled with the fruit of your salvation, the righteous character produced in your life by Jesus Christ. For this will bring much glory and praise to God. Each of us are amazingly designed by God with talents and gifts, skills and abilities. I was sitting next to Josh at the Christmas party. And I didn't realize Josh knew as much as he know about fixing cars and trucks. Now, this don't mean call Josh when your car or truck is sounding funny. But I'm sure if it was sounding funny, Josh can point you in the right direction. First Peter Chapter 4, verse 10. God has given each of you a gift from his great variety of spiritual gifts. Use them well to serve one another. That's the purpose of the church. To bring God's glory to the forefront. It's not to keep God's love a secret. Uh, The purpose and the process a secret 
We have the truth. We know the truth. And God expects us to share the truth with others. It's 2019. It's the end of 2019. 2020 is around the corner. How many people have you told about Jesus in 2019? How many? It's God's purpose for the church to help the unchurch discover their purpose. According to 2 Corinthians 4.15, all of this is for your benefit. And as God's grace reaches more and more people, there will be great thanksgiving and God will receive more and more glory. It's right there. They say in life you, you come to a fork in the road. Some folks say you, you have a come to Jesus moment. Church, will you live your life for the glory of God? If so, some things going to have to change in your life. Your priorities got to change. Your schedule might have to change. Some relationships you have uh, will change. It may even mean choosing the difficult road instead of the easy road. Remember, Jesus stood there knowing he would be crucified. He cried out, my soul has trouble. And what shall I say, Father? Save me from this hour. But for the purpose I come to this hour, Father, to glorify your name. Will you live for your own goals, your own comfort, your own pleasure? Or will you live the rest of your life for the glory of God? This here is your come to Jesus moment. The lesson is yours. I plead with you to come now while we together stand and sing a song of encouragement.